All right, it's 4.30. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy that you joined me. I am Alana. I am the creative director and executive producer at Film Kick. And today I'm going to be talking to Kyle Jones. And he is a fantastic video producer and he works for Run Studios at Microsoft. And he manages a team of over 20 people. And they have several studios up in Seattle and they have a lot of amazing things going on. And with COVID-19, they've actually, as the rest of us, they still have to shelter in place. So how has their work changed? How has it transitioned to this um, new way of living, at least for the moment now? And we're also going to be talking about how things look today and how he foresees things looking for the rest of the year. So he's handling videos for a bunch of different teams, a bunch of different projects. And so they have their standard workload, plus all of the events that went digital as well. So it's been getting crazy. So I'm very interested to know um, how he's doing and how his team is coping. So with that, um, Twitch just sent me a notification that we're good. So that's good. So I am going to bring Kyle on. Hi, Kyle. Hey, how's it going, Alana? It's going well. I really appreciate you being in the show. Thank you. Not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. Uh, I think uh, we share a lot of similarities with you being down at Google and also FilmKick with me uh, at Microsoft. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of similarities. It's an interesting world right now. It is. It is. So um, tell me when, let's just start at the beginning and then that way we just kind of move through. Um, did you, Seattle was one of the cities that was most impacted during, or at least first first impacted um, when this all started. When you saw that happening and you saw how other companies were interacting, did you foresee things um, progressing the way they have? That, you know, is interesting. Uh, I think we all hope that it was gonna be kind of a temporary blip for some point, you know, maybe it lasts a month, but it would kind of, you know, a lot of my clients really wish they could get back into studio. And so they just kept pushing stuff off and pushing stuff off. So at Microsoft, when they kind of told us, hey, you can't be in your studio anymore, we had about 25 to 35 projects that were about to go into production. Uh, and so we kind of had to you know, take a big pause like everyone else did and kind of reevaluate, hey, where are we at? You know, I think we had 10 projects who you know, immediately said, this has to be done in the studio, we're just gonna wait. Uh, you know, we had a bunch of other projects who the priority on that project, so the clients that came to us said, hey, my priorities got shifted, so this is going to put on the back burner. And then we have probably another 20, 15, 20 projects where we had to figure it out. And, you know, it had a lot of rescoping had to happen. A lot of new expectation setting had to happen with clients, with team members, with management, all sorts of fun stuff. Wow. Yeah, I bet. So of all of those challenges, which one stands out as one that was especially fun? You know, fun's an interesting term to use. I think one of the one of the ones that has has made the most impact on me, honestly, is just, you know, it's a huge pivot, right? So everyone's driving down the same road and the same expectations are set. You can be in studio, you have the cameras, you have the lights, you have the the microphones, you know, and a lot of what we, you and me would worry about is the content. Is the content good? Is it right. baked? Is it 100%, right? Now, one of the challenges that we've really seen is there are so many more variables to this equation. You know, yeah. we don't know what camera have, we don't know what mic they have, we don't know what their home setup's gonna look like, we don't know what their lighting situation is gonna be. You know, right. are they gonna look blue because there's tungsten in the background and they're trying to auto expose? Like, what is going on? So, <laughs> with all of those variables comes a lot of re education for, you know, not only our client, but our, also our team is having to pivot too to, to new softwares, to new hardwares. Uh, so, you know, it's not only re-educating our clients, but it's a steep learning curve for the producers. And uh, we have production specialists that do a lot of the day-to-day -day technical stuff in studio. It's re-educating them as to, you know, how we're going to go about doing this as a team in a cohesive manner that makes sense. And, you right. know, I think that if it's pivoting a small team of one or two people is really easy because you can teach that really easy. Yep. But getting an uptake of 20 people and getting them all on the same page, I sit in a lot of meetings where I say the same thing. I sit in a lot of uh, calls, scoping calls, where it's just kind of, you know, it's going to take a while for everyone to feel comfortable quoting this and doing scoping for all this uh, yeah. because it's they haven't done it before at this scale. You know, right. I think we've all done projects every once in a while where, you know, someone's in Africa and they can't get flown into Seattle or Redmond to do a recording. So we're going to do a virtual recording and we do it, but it's not our first priority, right? 
If right. we had our option, they would be fly flown in. They would be in studio. We'd do it there. It would look better. It would sound better, blah, blah, blah. Right. We don't have that now, right? And so we have this, uh, you know, deck of cards that we're all kind of playing with, trying to figure out the game that's in front of us. It's, it's very interesting. It is very interesting. I mean, I would say, oh, and I had a studio in San Jose where I had the show. I would tell you, Kyle, next time you're down in San Jose, let's shoot it together. I wouldn't even consider beaming you in. Like people are normally beamed in when they are on a remote location shooting a film in Africa, you know, and that's why they're beamed in. Right. Like there's always a really special reason why they're not there, why what they're doing is somehow more important. For everything that we've done, it is important to just bring the person in and do it right. But in a way that has opened up so many more, uh, so many uh, more feeds, more people that we probably would have never been able to get to because they can't leave their country or they don't normally fly. Um, we've been able to bring them onto shows, which has been really interesting, or shows or you know recordings or yeah. anything. So okay, so that happened, um, and now you guys have been how many weeks in? Six, seven, eight? Uh, probably. I, I have lost count. I would say like six. <laughs> It sounds okay. good. Okay, six uh, sounds we're better. Six, six from working from home, uh, not only doing editing but also doing recording uh, solely from home. So tell uh, me then, how does your how does your team's workday look like today? So uh, my team is set up in kind of two halves, right? So we have our producer half, uh, and then we have what we call our production specialists. Our producers. They do a lot of the scheduling, the coordinating, all the booking of the studios, or I guess now the people's virtual events uh, and things like that. And then we have the production specialists, which, which handle, you know, all the technical stuff that would happen in studio and, as well as the editing. So they do as soon as a client kind of comes into the studio or during the uh, day of filming, uh, they kind of make all the magic happen in the studio. They run the camera, they do the audio, they may run teleprompter, they yeah. do all the lighting, they do all the technical stuff. Um, and then they also do editing as well. So that's kind of how the two halves work. So right now it's, uh, you know, the production side of the house, our production specialists and our editors, they're working from home. Uh, we have, there's, we have a, a software called HPZ central, which allows us to remote into our machines at work at Microsoft and use them to edit. Uh, which has been fantastic. So, you know, from an editing standpoint, we were able to kind of continue on our way. Uh, and then from a recording standpoint, it's kind of been the biggest learning that we've taken away, right? It's, you know, how are we going to continue to re record this? Do we send right. switchers out to people's houses? <laughs> is there software? You know, what, what is the solution? Um, and I think that, you know, at first it was like, okay, we need some band-aids. I think everyone said, okay, what can be our band-aid? So we have two TriCaster minis that we sent out to two of our production specialists. And so uh, we had two people that kind of inside of a couple days were up and going from home and they could record, they could record interviews. Uh, you know, that's someone who was setting up uh, at their house. So, uh, so yeah. And then as we kind of went down the route of, well, we can't continue to do this from, uh, you know, send TriCaster minis out to people. That's not a viable solution. Uh, we started to go the, uh, the software route. And I think, you know, me and you a lot talked a lot about, uh, you know, we talked a lot about what software. Uh, right now, I right. think you're using Stage 10. Right. Uh, Wirecast is thrown out there. There's another, uh, you know, handful of programs that will help people record content. And it's a lot yeah. to search through to figure out exactly what options you need or don't need. And sometimes you don't know until you buy the product and can thoroughly test it. I mean, I would say um, that's the only way to know. You And, and it's not just testing it. It's running your first broadcast. Yeah. You, there are just some things that you don't know. In theory, they work. And when you test them, because you're only testing them for two, three minutes at a time, suddenly when you're in a broadcast and you're 10 minutes in with that person sharing their screen and using their camera, like having those two things being beamed in from their house, that's when you know what works and what actually doesn't work. You have to use it live. It's crazy. Well, and you know, to my point earlier is, everyone's setup, home setup is going to be different. You know, yeah. we may test with someone at a given location and it may work on their laptop and their computer and their mic, but you pull someone else in and they can't connect their mic. They, their video camera isn't working. Uh, you know, w a, a litany of many of things could happen now. There's so yeah. many more variables to this situation. So uh, it's, you know, not testing it once, testing it a bunch of times to see how many times you can repeat yeah. it and it has the same functionality that works. Um, so right now we just invested in uh, 
four or five licenses of Wirecast. Right. We we have been super, super booked with other recordings and posts. And so I'm trying to get time for people to test this and adequately so that we feel comfortable recording execs. Right yeah. now, I don't really feel, it's not bulletproof enough for me to roll the dice of recording an exec and feeling really good about it. Uh, and I actually- ben I want to stop you there for a second then, because we're going to look back at this and we're going to say, oh my God, look at what we were doing. So I ask you today, working from home, oh wait, before I ask you something, I'm going to do something, which is say, happy single day. Alana was very nice enough to send me an entire kit to make margaritas. I and did. little did she know that tequila was sold out. So what I got today in the mail was funny enough what i actually needed i had tequila i did not have margarita mix so i i got an amazing package today with <laughs> margarita mix and all everything that i needed added my own tequila and uh cheers salute uh cheers to cheers i went to my local restaurant and my local mexican restaurant oh sorry and i got my margarita from them and yeah, every time we go out, you always pay. So I was like, I'll get the drink this time. <laughs> well, it was so, much appreciated. I literally was like, I think I have lunch where I can go up to the Safeway and I can get margarita mix. And then like at like 1030, there's a knock on the door. I was like, who is knocking on my door? That's so weird. He was like, here you go. I'm like, okay, sweet. It's everything I need. It's Christmas for adults. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. And so what I wanted to ask you is today, what does your bulletproof when you are going to shoot an exec where you really need to have removed the least, the most amount of unknowns and have the most safe route. What is, what does your safe route look like these days? For sure, a shoot? sure. So bulletproof for us right now is, um, so Microsoft uh, uses a program called Teams. And if you're not familiar with Teams, it's basically if you took Slack and Zoom and push them together, uh, that's kind of what you have. So there's nice. video conferencing, there's chats, there's like Slack, you can create teams and you can share content. Uh, and so all of Microsoft basically Sounds runs like Google on, Meet. <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit, except it also has chat. Fun anyway, I'm sure it's very similar to Google, but we run on teams. Mm -hmm. And so all of our execs and all the people who work there, they know how to do teams, right? So for right. us is trying to get them in an environment that they're comfortable with and teams is that. So basically what we do is we you know, ha have someone who has our TriCaster Mini at their house and we have two Teams calls and we do a mix minus on the audio. So wow. we're doing individual calls with them. We're recording their isolated feeds and then we're shoving the signals into each other with the switcher so yeah. they can see each other and have a conversation. But yet we have the most flexibility in post to go back yeah. and do what we need to do. So that's, for us, that's as bulletproof as it gets um, right now. But I would I mean, say, that sounds, you know, I think, That sounds great. I, that sounds like a yeah, great I mean, solution. It's great, except that every it's great for one-on-one -on -one conversations, right? One-on-one, -on -one, awesome. As soon as you add people, you need another laptop into that situation. You need another Magwell to take that and be able to do the mix minuses that you need to be. Yeah. So it it can get to be a quite a large setup if you have a lot of people that all need to talk. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, and this is a, a anecdote that I think I shared with you when we did our pre-pro call was, I feel like right now everyone is doing the same equation, but they're kind of doing it like long division, right? They're writing out the numbers, but they're getting there, but it's taking a little time. And so, yeah. you know, three months from now, there's going to be like doing it on a calculator. You punch in the numbers, you press go, it'll give you the answer. And six months from now, I hope there's just an app where you push a button and you're good to go. We're all kind of figuring this out together and we'll eventually get there, but we just need to put the reps in to get there. Yeah. That's that's 100% true. And we have to do it very fast and we have to do it on real projects. So there is no like going back to school or going to L Las, Las Vegas for a seminar for a week so that we can learn how to do it. It's like, no, you're going to learn how to do it with a call, with a client, with an exec, and you're going to make it work. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, I, I enjoy forcing functions because um, I, I truly believe that a lot of people will continue to put stuff off unless there's a forcing function to drive them to learn a new skill or learn a new way of doing something or a new program. And this is a giant forcing function for us to really learn how to do virtual well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, then we've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. Let's talk about the future. So what does it look like? Let's say it's October and you have an important shoot. Tell me what that would look like. Uh, so, you know, 
I'm going to stay on the virtual and then I'll kind of transform into hopefully where we're going to be from a studio setting. So Microsoft, uh, as along with other, you know, corporations, they've dedicated, they've said that, you know, we're not going to do any more live or we're not going to do any more on-site events for the next fiscal year. So for Microsoft for 20, their fiscal year 21, which is going to start in July for that entire year, they're not going to have any, in, you know, they're not going to do any big, you know, Las Vegas shows or, you know, Ignite that's in uh, in Florida. None of that big show that they would spend millions of dollars on. Yeah. They've taken and said, you know, we're going to get proactive about this entire situation and we're going to go virtual. So they made that call a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago, which I actually really like because it allows people to actually plan accordingly. Yeah. And I know that we, we kind of commiserated before, before we went live is there's a lot of people who are pivoting right now to to try to figure out how these events are gonna work in a virtual setting. And, right. and there's a lot of people from marketing to PR who are very used to in-personal events and they know how it works. They know where their money is going. They know what it, it takes for success. Right now, it's kind of the wild west. No one exactly knows what success looks like from a virtual event. Um, it is very <laughs> untested water, right? We have that conversation daily. And what's yep. interesting is that, um, two weeks into this whole thing, I interviewed one of my best friends and she is a, she handles a team of field marketers and her whole thing has, has been field marketing and has been like going out to events and handling the vendors for that, the, the treats, the alcohol, the gifts, the, 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 the customer engineers or whatever salespeople are called in different companies and um, getting them up to speed with what's happening and videos at the booth and, you know, a lot of stuff. And suddenly she's had to, all of her events went digital. So she had, and but there is a digital events team that's completely separate than hers. So yeah. what was very interesting is that I was able to see from her viewpoint, because I know from the receiving end of, you know, a marketer that has never done a virtual event before, I can tell when they send me that initial email, if they've had experience with this or not. But I was, I've had a lot more empathy for those people when they email me, because I just had that interview with a friend of mine and she was like, I'm trying my best, you know, like I'm doing something I've never done. Suddenly a hundred plus events have gone digital and I need to be able to continue to deliver what we have promised to our customers, to our potential customers, to our partners. And it's definitely like, we're all kind of at, back at square one in many, many ways. I think we're all doing a lot of learning. And you know, one of the, I really hope one of the really great takeaways from all of this uh, is people getting used to what it be, to people really understanding what it means to uh, do virtual presentations or be on camera. Even just in general meetings, I feel like people are really scared when, you know, when they come into a studio and the lights are on them and the camera's on and the mics, it's, it's a very dead place in terms of, <laughs> being able to get feedback from an audience. A lot of people are great on stage. A lot of people are great on stage. They feed yeah. off the audience, you know, they can shift their point of view, uh, look at different people. But when you're talking to a camera, there's no one in this room to get feedback as if I'm doing a good job. I'm just smiling and pretending like I'm doing a really good job. And right. some people fake it until they make it a lot better than others. But I really hope that with this, with people turning on their cameras and meetings, they get a little bit more used to what they look like on camera. You know, yeah. I'm using I'm using a GoPro. You can probably tell from the little fish eye on on my lens here. Uh, we have that set up, but you know, to each their own. Everyone's going to have their own setup. This is a this is a fifteen dollar piece of fabric from, uh, from Walmart. <laughs> um, I love it. That that's actually one of my favorite things to do in calls when people say, we, you know, "Where are you at a beach house?" I said, "No." No, uh, I got that from Walmart. I'm just, it's hanging in the background. It's about six inches behind me. Uh, it's, it looks it's really ridiculous. good. I also it thought maybe you were outside or something. <laughs> it looks ridiculously real. Not in person, it looks really fake though. Uh, so it's interesting. You know, this is some of the other stuff that we're trying to figure out how, how we can scale to make people more feel and look better on camera. Uh, so Go that ahead. brings me to a question. Um, you're, 
we as producers we're always thinking about our talent and how to get them to best perform because we know that the crew is good it's solid the crew understands what they're doing we show up we do the work we put our time we, we go it's normally the talent that's um, being exposed to something new and different but in this case you are handling a team of people that are having to work differently and if you could give any advice to somebody like you that is um, kind of overseeing a team of people that are professionals, like they, they really know what they're doing. They handle these events at scale. They know how to handle the best cameras in the world. And now they're working with webcams. So what have you encountered and what have you experienced as a manager specifically that you could impart to other managers to kind of um, let them give them give them some hope or let them know that they can do this a little bit better. Um, I, you know, I think that the entire world right now can just use a lot of empathy. So I think that number one, really go into every situation, realizing that you don't know what this person's life is like at home. You don't know what their family life is like. There's so many things out of your control right now, and that's okay. All that people really want is people to you know, show empathy that they may be having a bad day and it may be for reasons you don't really know. Uh, team on a weekly basis to see you know, exactly how they're feeling, how they're doing with everything. Uh, and you know, I get mixed feedbacks. People have good weeks, they have bad weeks, but you know, I think even just touching base with them they enjoy the fact that I care because I care about them. They're, we act like a family. Uh, you know, every Friday at four o'clock, we do a happy hour because we miss seeing each other in person. And so, you know, I think empathy is great. I think, you know, really touch base with people on a personal basis. And besides the workload, ask how, how they're doing. How, you know, how are they dealing, doing with COVID? How is it affecting them? And, you know, I thought maybe it may be a little cheesy at first, but I, I the feedback that I got has been really great um, because I above all I just want them to know that I care a lot about besides work I care about them and their their mental health and I think keeping everyone's mental health uh, you know in the forethought of all of your actions right now is very very imperative it's very easy to get lost and think things are taking longer they're not getting the learning curve they need to get uh, you know it's they didn't they didn't deliver this on time whatever it is you can talk to them about that but have empathy for everyone's differing situation uh so that's from a managerial standpoint you know talk to your staff early often let them know that they can come to you with personal stuff uh if they don't feel comfortable with coming to you talk to them about the hr uh, program that your company may have uh, you know, my company's done a great job of making sure that, you know, there's extra counselors, whether that's, you know, a phone number, you text, whatever it is, there's options out there. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of that. I mean, uh, I think communicate, uh, you know, be as transparent during this time as you can. Uh, I think that, uh, y you know, if you try to hold stuff back, it's going to come across in a really negative fashion right now. And so just, you know, be as transparent as you can about whether it's a process or a procedure or a client or, you know, your vendor company or your big corporate company, whatever it is, uh, you know, it goes a long way to have people, you know, know that you're not holding anything back and that, you, that, you know, also, you know, for my team is making sure they know they have a seat at the table. We have weekly check-ins with the entire team uh, about processes. Process is shifting drastically. Uh, uh, our capabilities are shifting drastically. And so making sure that in these meetings we touch base so everyone is comfortable talking about the newest capabilities or the new software or what certain people can do at their house or can't do at their house or we need to go into campus to do this. Uh, and just making sure everyone's informed. I think that people get scared when they don't feel informed uh, so, you know, the more informing you can do and just keeping people in the loop, uh, people send, tend to react pretty positively to that. That's awesome. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. My bows ran out of battery and that's why that whole little thing happened. But I heard you the whole time. Um, well, you know, I think that it's, 
I'm really, really happy that I'm doing these because I've been able to speak these lives, these live shows, because I've been able to speak with people in different positions and different um, levels and to hear how they're coping. And to go back to what you were saying, we, in a way, we were all stripped of our, the things that we were very, very confident about. And even the people that normally work from home, because I do work with people and different teams that do work from home, they don't normally work from home with their spouse also at home or their kids at home, right? So it has been kind of a, uh, I don't wanna say fully an equalizer, just because the reality is that it's not equal for everyone. Like I have certain meetings with people that they have their own office, that views into into all of Colorado, and that is very different than my home bedroom scenario, right? So it hasn't completely equalized us, but in a way it has made us more human. And with that, we have been able to admit when we don't know something, when we haven't done something. And I feel like I have been, I work with really amazing, smart people. And um, as that, and as younger people or older people, we all want to show that we know what we're talking about, that we know the, the, the latest. And in this situation, it's been, it's been humbling to be in so many meetings where I'm talking to people that are like, dude, this is the first time I do this. Can you walk me through that? Or nobody's pretending to know. Nobody's like, I'll Google that later because I don't wanna interrupt and say that I don't understand. Like people are speaking up and they're saying, I don't know what you're saying, but I really need this to be successful and I need to understand what you're saying. So can you please explain that to me? And I, I have loved that. I have loved that everybody is now willing to learn and willing to say when they haven't done something, they don't have to fake it because nobody has done this. It's a new thing. So it's, it's for me, I think that especially in production, you know, in production, you, you, you walk on set and you want to pretend that, you know, all the words that people are saying. And, you know, sure. we, we become really good at um, kind of faking it. And I think that it's been great to yeah. just, you know, put your hand up in a meeting and say, no, if this hasn't been done we don't know what we're doing and we're gonna have some failures and we're gonna have some successes and with failures i will ask you what has been the number one challenge that your team has had to deal with the number one challenge um you know i lovingly will say that in the past our number one challenge has been uh our clients is them coming buttoned up you know, with things that are cohesive, whether it's a script, whether it's a demo, whatever it is, uh, you know, we do a lot of prep and we can control in studio, we can control everything, right? Lights, cameras, all this stuff. The only thing that we, we really lacked a lot of control with was, you know, making sure someone's script was what they wanted and that it was a cohesive piece, uh, that the demo was gonna work, that it wasn't a beta software, that, you know, the virtual machine was broken. Like, that's what we worried about before. The challenge now has been re-education uh, about everything. It's re-education for not only our clients about what things are going to look and sound like now and what the aesthetic of virtual recording uh, will be, uh, but also the options that they have when it comes to virtual recordings. Uh, and, you know, is it something where you have ex extra money and you want to spend some graphics that maybe make it a little bit, you know, fancy or better looking or, you know, more interactive, whatever that may be. But also on the other side, it's, it's, you know, keeping a team of 20 people up to speed as to what's going on uh, and making sure that they all feel empowered to be able to talk to clients, to be able to scope calls, to be able to get on with an exec and tell them that that poster in the background has to go because it's not compliant for Microsoft uh, from a legal standpoint. Like it's all of this stuff that uh, you don't really think about it until you're doing it. And virtual recordings has uh, kind of moved a lot of things to the forefront. We've created a lot of best practices, uh, how-to guides, uh, documentation, both in video and written form, as to how to coach people to be better presenters in a, in a Teams call or in a Hangout. Uh, you know, where to look, what to do with your hands, how to share content. Uh, that people didn't really care about before, but now they are really starting to care about their virtual presence. I would say that most, most C-level execs 
didn't really care how they looked on camera because they weren't ever going to get recorded on camera at their house. They're going to go into studio and they're going to have the budget to do that. Um, now they don't. And now they're doing their live recordings from their bedroom because their kids are running around downstairs and their dogs are really loud and their bedroom is the only place they can close the door and shoot it. And so to your point earlier, it really humanizes a lot of people and you go, that person has to be making a lot of money. They don't have an office they can close the door in. Like it, it gives you a little glimpse into people's lives that you've never had before. Uh, and I, 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 I personally love it. I'm sure that some of the people who are now having to shoot from their bedrooms may, uh, I mean, just to be perfectly honest, uh, I checked in with my rep at B and H and they're sold out, uh, for the, they're sold out of webcams until the beginning of June. Uh, and so, so it's one of those things where, you know, it's gonna, it's not going to just be now. It's going to be for the next three months, the next six months. Uh, and so Amazon is sold out of capture cards, sold yeah. out. <laughs> I had to um, send one to a friend of mine today that an extra one that I had, but even Amazon is sold out of capture cards. And for those of you that don't know what capture cards are, they basically turn your DSLR, whatever cam or any camera that you have into a webcam. And yeah. it's a 200 or a a hundred to two hundred dollar piece of software or a piece of hardware that you just connect some cables in and suddenly instead of using the iMac or whatever cam whatever computer's webcam you can use your really nice camera um, yeah. and yeah so Amazon is sold out of those as well. We had to go with a different option. So typically we use a brand called Magewell or Magwell. Um, those got sold out a long time ago. So we went with a new brand called Osprey. It seems to do the trick, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of the, the really well-known brands for anything that takes a video and audio and puts it into a computer, it's, it's going to take a, a long time for them to go back uh, and get stuff in stock. So anyways, with that, it's been really interesting to talk to C-level execs who are trying to figure out how to source a webcam or how they can get a camera that looks better than the built-in 720p one that's on their laptop. Uh, and so it's hard to look at CVP in the eye and tell them, I'm sorry, they're sold out. Uh, and so, you know, I've created a little solution with a, a GoPro and we're trying to shop those around and put together kits to send to people as well. Uh, so we have our big studio on campus is Microsoft Production Studios. They put together a kit to send to C-level execs when they're doing re recordings, especially for events, to have them look a little bit more polished. So there are things that are being made, but then again, it takes a long time to source all the material because some of them are sold out. So it's not only conceptualizing it, but it's ordering the parts, getting them all, putting them together and shipping them out. You know, I would say that I have 10 more of these kind of GoPro kits coming down and it they'll probably be good to go in like two weeks. We'll just kind of have to see if all the parts come in, honestly. Yeah, um, I'm having to mute myself between because I have to use my desktop um, microphone and then we would hear a, an echo from you because there's a lag. Um, so that's why I'm muting myself. I have a question for you. It's 5.04. I have two more questions for you, but I know that. Do you have a hard stop at 5? I want to be mindful of your time. I want to have a hard stop at like 5.15. But I can go a little long. Okay, then let's do it. Let's do it. So yeah. my my question for you as a producer is I feel like my team when we went and you know, they might not like me talking about this, but I'm just going to say it. Um, when we went, I'll blame it on the margarita. Sure. That's what okay. I'll do. Okay. So when everything went digital, um, my team just postponed all the shoots because they were like, no, we're not shooting in people's houses. No, nope, we're not using webcams. Like, nope. It was a big old no. And as new, I'm saying day zero, by the way, like day one, that's what happened. So they postponed all of the shoots and they said, no, if we can't capture it in the studio. If we can't do things right, we're not going to do it. And I respect them for that. For sure. Um, I had um, a big event that I was going to be a live producer for, which I didn't know how to do. And then I used all of my smaller projects as um, tests <laughs> where I could then 
test the software and make sure that it worked the way that I needed it to. And then that way, when that big event came up, I wasn't a total noob, you know? And so I didn't postpone things, but my team, because we are filmmakers, right? So we are making corporate video, but at our core, we're filmmakers and we like to make beautiful things. And now, you know, not now, sorry, like three or four weeks ago, my team was like, okay, I guess we can't postpone this indefinitely anymore. So we're gonna have to start like biting the bullet and seeing how to do it. And I'm wondering, what I have noticed, and I don't, I, I, I had this in my last episode, and I hate putting, fishing for an answer. You can completely disagree with me. What I have encountered is that a lot of my filmmaking buddies that were saying, like, if it's not with a Red or an Alexa, I don't mm -hmm. want to hear it. A lot of them are like, you know, you can do some really cool shit with an iPhone. <laughs> and I've seen, like, I've seen them come around on that. And I'm wondering, do you think that your team, and it's okay if they haven't, and no judgment if they haven't, I'm, that's why I'm not fishing for an answer, but sure. do you think that your team is going to approach projects differently moving forward, having had this like corona time? Uh, I would say probably yes. I, I think the entire world will move forward in a different way. And I think that it's gonna touch upon almost every single industry that's out there. I mean, it really will have a very lasting effect. Right now, this time is going to be get written about in history books, right? It's like people who lived through the Vietnam War or the Depression. This is one of those times where there's going to be history, you know, giant history books written about this time. So I think that 100% yes. I think we were, this will affect how we go about telling stories, how we how the different aesthetics that are acceptable. I think that from a story tor storyteller standpoint and someone who is used to using reds or aries or you know 30 40 thousand dollar rigs to shoot a single talking head they're used to an aesthetic that you can't get on virtual video you can you know there's no way even if i had a magwell shoved in and an ari in front of me we're at the mercy of the bandwidth of the internet right and it doesn't work that way and so i think that I think that especially for the next year, I can't see Microsoft sending people back into campus for at least the next year. If they have a good work from home situation, unless there's a reason why they need to be on site, I don't think Microsoft will ask them to be back on site. I can see a lot of people figuring out that, oh shit, if I don't have to be on site, maybe I'm gonna move to like Colorado in the middle of nowhere because I can do my job from remote and it's acceptable now. And so you're gonna have a lot of people who you know, they're like, well, I don't live in downtown Seattle. I'm getting taxed. Traffic is horrible. I'm going to go move out and I can do my daily work and live out in a log cabin. And as long as I get internet, I should be good. So I think we're going to, I think virtual recording is not going to go away past COVID, right? It's going to be around for a long time. And I think that the work that we're putting into now to figure out this, these solutions is going to be something that really pays off a year, two, three years from now, where it is very common for people to telecommute every single day. Uh, I think there's always going to be reason to fly someone in to have them in studio or to go see someone on location to shoot a you know case study or something super high profile. But the aesthetic of recording from home, uh, you know, if you can shoot an SNL episode from home, if you can shoot, uh, if you can do an ESPN draft from home, you know, to you misuse a quote from Jurassic Park, life will find a way, right? And, uh, you know, we're going to find a way going forward, and it's going to be interesting. I don't think any of us know exactly what it's going to be, but I think we're getting flavors of it right now. You know, there's always going to be stories that need to be told in studio or on location, but for the rest of it, if we can make virtual recording work, I think that it's going to really do the job for a lot of different stuff. And I think... If you can pivot to virtual, I think there's a lot of people that had a really hard time pivoting. Uh, you know, I think there's people who put their foot down and said, you know, this is going to pass. You know, they can record their crappy internet videos, but they're going to come back into the studio as soon as this finishes. Uh, and I just don't think that's going to be the way six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. You know, studios will never be the same. It's going to be interesting, very interesting to see how Hollywood, Netflix reacts and however they pick up production is going to be very interesting. I agree. Um, I was just in a meeting today where I was asked to come in to offer my guidance as to 
what is needed from a, what is the bare minimum that a studio needs in order to be a studio. And what's happening is that one of the people that I, one of the clients that I work with, they have all of these small event studios or conference rooms. So they're like conference rooms for like 30 to 100 people maybe. So they're they're smaller called these, I don't wanna say the name, but they're, they're smaller um, conference rooms where they bring people from all over the world and my client has decided that for the next year, those aren't going to be used. So what they're going to do is they're actually going to construct them, build them into smaller studios because yeah. they understand the, the purpose and the need to have these like ongoing events that are happening. So that need doesn't go away, but how we deliver that content is what's going to change and pivot. So I was brought in to say, okay, well, we have this, these many feet by these many feet and how many studios can we fit into that? So instead of like booking a conference room, you can actually book a video production room where what you, that way we can elevate the content. So for the people that are, that do go back to the office, because I completely agree with you, that some people are gonna wanna stay remote um, sure. or move or whatever, but the people that do come back to the office, they're not gonna be able to engage with their clients in the same way or their partners in the same way or their employees in, APAC or EMEA Europe in the same way and they need to be able to continue to communicate. So what's going to happen is that in these buildings we're already seeing an infrastructure change as to how we're going to conduct the future. So like phone rooms for example and meeting rooms, things that probably weren't a staple in offices 50 years ago. These mini studios are going to become a staple in, of offices moving forward, right? And it's it's yeah. really impressive to see, to as you say, this time is going to be written in history books and we're in the middle of it. Like I was invited into a meeting to say, hey, so we're about to spend like many millions of dollars into converting these rooms into studios. Do you have anything to say? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I do. I have a so, few things to say about so, that. This is definitely a longer conversation for today. Uh, when I started out at Microsoft six and a half years ago or so, the studio that we had um, was probably slightly bigger than the room that I'm in now, and that included a control room, and the actual studio. I mean, it was tiny. So if we can definitely kind of take the construction of that, uh, and it was built for one person to operate. Uh, and so, you know, we can definitely take that offline to kind of some tips and tricks that we learned. But, uh, Let's do it. Well, I will yeah. ask you, do you have any last, um, anything you'd like to say before we end? Uh, you know, the things that I have to say are, you know, show empathy, you know, tip out, if you get, you know, food to go, tip out the people that are still working. Uh, it's the people that are doing the everyday stuff from the doctors and nurses who are in the hospitals to the people who are uh, at the grocery stores to the Mexican joint who's still serving margaritas. Uh, they're working their ass off right now to stay, to stay relevant and to stay open. Um, you know, there's, I'm in a very small community who have, who has a very small, like road of, you know, business owners. And I try to go out and support them. So support local, so support the small, medium businesses, all you can. Um, and you know, thank the people who are still out there making sure that you can get toilet paper. Uh, you know, the Costco's who you can go in and buy your eight pounds of chicken to make sure that you can take it home and be able to cook. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who are in thankless jobs right now who are busting their butt uh, and, you know, putting their health at risk to make sure that we can continue to do what we do. Um, so, you know, thank people, tip them out as, as best you can, um, you know, Continue to be creative while you're at home. Make sure that if you are working from home, you schedule time to go walk around the block. Uh, I'm very guilty from sitting in front of this all day long and just doing meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting and not taking time to get up and go, whether it's sunshine or raining out, but mental health is huge. Make sure that you continue to think about your mental health or your, and your team's mental health uh, and do what you need to do to, you know, make sure that you don't go to a bad place. Um, you know, whatever that may be. Thank you. 
Oh my God, it's the, you're on mute situation. Um, we've all been in those meetings recently. You're still on mute. Um, I love being able, being the admin so I can just unmute them. Uh, anyway, Kyle, it's been a pleasure. It's always nice talking to you. It's nice to hear another producer that's going through a lot of the same challenges because together, even whether you're using uh, Microsoft Teams or I'm using Google Meet, we have a lot in common in terms of how are we are we getting those feeds to look nice <laughs> so we have we have a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities to grow from so i really appreciate your time and i hope that the people watching uh, will have learned something from this so thank you for sure well thank you for having me on it's a pleasure if you want to do it again i'm totally down i feel like we could do this for a couple hours so hopefully we're not boring the people that are watching they're still watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, I go to me and I want to say thank you. It's been a few weeks. I really lost count. It's been ups, it's been downs, and I had a conversation with an amazing, amazing woman. She's going to be in the, the leader of a Fortune 5 company in someday, and I will have said that I knew her as a person, and she's amazing. And one thing that she said is that some people are having good days and some people are having bad days and the same person is having both. And sometimes you're that person that's having a good day and sometimes you're that person that's having a bad day and that's okay. And I think that as leaders, we need to understand that and we need to be, like Kyle said so well, we do need to be more empathetic. And um, in the, I'm not saying that I'm doing this because of empathy, I'm doing this because I admire this man more than anything in the world and I'm going to be interviewing my father this week on the show and he has been in marketing for God knows how many years. He still has a thriving agency in Puerto Rico and I'm going to be interviewing him on the show and I um, am really looking forward to this and if I start crying a lot while we're doing this, um, you know, no apologies because I love my dad. Um, but I am going to be interviewing him this week and we're also going to be doing a round tomorrow. I'm going to be doing a round two with Peggy on our super amazing learning live that we had last week. It wasn't a failure. It was good. It was so good. I learned a lot. And so the more I learn, the more I failed. And you see, so if I fail a lot, that just means I learned a lot and that's great. So I'm gonna be doing that with her on Wednesday. With my dad, I'm gonna be meeting on Thursday. And on Friday, I'm gonna be meeting with the feistiest Chilean you've ever met. Her name is Mina Mansui and she is a dentist and she's working from home. So how is that happening? And with that, I am done listening to my voice. So good night, have, stay healthy and all those things that you do people. Bye.